You doing this 49 years, tell me about your, your tripping areas. Like, it was never perfect, was it? No. So where did you learn from your mistakes? What fine mistakes years ago did you learn from and what did you do about it? Uh, you know, you uh, in the manufactured housing business, uh, it, that was years ago, 49 years ago. Um, yeah, the quality of the units, uh, I would say they were okay, right? But it was built by a different standard, right? Because all these were relocatable, right? And it really, they were caused because after the war, all of our servicemen came home and needed a place to live that they could afford. Oh, so these were designed to be re relocatable. In a, they come back up with them somewhere else. And originally, oh, manufacturing see, I, I think that's beautiful, right? Personally. Uh, and the military came home and they didn't have high income, so they needed something they could afford to do, and then they need to be able to transport it to wherever they were going to live, right? And so they were all built on trailers, right, with axles and wheels, and you'd take them to a site and you'd set them down. Most always leave the axles and wheels on it. Sometimes you take the wheels off just to put them back on if you want to transport it, right? So they were all relocatable. Uh, and that was under a HUD code that was developed in the U.S. Uh, so you could build the same product anywhere, right? Uh, it, wasn't, it didn't take a different municipality or something to change a code. These were all built by the HUD code, and they were all transportable to any location you wanted to. And you'd build them one way. Right, um, and that was uh, back for manufactured housing, and then modular housing changed things because then you were building the same as a traditional site-built house, but you were building it inside a plant, and so you had to meet all the codes of every municipality out there, the regular building codes, right? <clears throat> so uh, that took a lot of education to understand the codes for all these different states and all the different municipalities in the in the states. Uh, so. Uh, we started doing everything code compliant, just like you were going to build something traditionally. Did you find that minimum code even years ago? Because I did, you know, the bat installation, the vapor barrier. I remember them joking with me and I'm talking to engineers in, in New Orleans when they go, oh, he's going to put the vapor barrier on the inside. And I said, actually, I'm not using vapor barrier. I didn't like the way they were talking to mm -hmm. me. So on the warm side, it's always on the warm side, depending how hot the area is, they're going to put on the outside. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to stop that hot airflow, if it's really hot outside, from getting it to the inside of the house and vice versa in the summer, the cool air escaping. The issue with it, you know, when I talk about this all the time, you know, why does mold actually grow? And just this, this was in the fridge, this bottle, right? We've got mm -hmm. the, on the outside, is condensating. Why? Because it's cold inside and it's hotter in this room and it's going to create condensation. Even this plastic is thicker than the six mil minimum code, you know, that mm -hmm. we use today. The whole point of this was to, to, to create a thermal break over a thermal barrier because this didn't work. So a thermal break, whether you use a, a closed cell spray form, which you see on the show that I do all the time, or just think the simplicity of a cooler. The cheapest form of foam in the world, styrofoam, is the cheapest, but it will keep the ice cubes cold for 24 hours. It keeps the ice cubes in mm -hmm. ice cube form for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So that creates the thermal break, stopping the hot from eating cold, which is the first food group of mold. Mm -hmm. Second is organic, the lumber, the paper on the drywall. What have you done? And in, because in, I'm curious, have you taken this to the next level? Are you doing compression on your walls? Uh, are they put through presses? What do you do? Uh, we don't use compression. Uh, we're we're building our walls and then we're insulating our walls uh, with a craft back insulation, and then we back it with a barrier that comes over the top of that, and then a barrier that also is sprayed on, right, to to saturate the house and, and make sure that we have a barrier free house, right. So our construction is typical of traditional construction today. We follow the prescriptive path that's given us through our engineering and codes to build according to what the codes are today. Do you do anything above code? Now, first of all, I'm, I'm quite confident that you do everything very well because mm -hmm. if you're you're covering the codes of literally the United States on any given area, which mm -hmm. we need to do this, so you're already above code doing this, especially because you're combining it across the country. But if you attempted to go further, because the automation I get, you know, it just makes it faster, simpler, uh, uh, within a fraction of an inch of mistake. There are almost mm -hmm. no errors whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that, you know, have you changed materials, lumber? Have you tried fire-rated lumber? Have you gone further into just 
let's say, you know, the further things in the future, I'm curious. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, we've, we've tried several different things, uh, and we build several different ways because sometimes our approvals uh, require fire treated lumber, right? So we have buildings that have fire treated lumbers, and we have other buildings that do not. Right. The, the difference of what we do is we build with a, a grade one lumber material. We don't use two and better. Good. We don't use any of that because we want the cleanest lumber we can possibly get. 